winning cures everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 105. This is the Tuesday, July 25th edition of the show. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. We've got a full show today for sure. We're bringing in first-timers to the program, Kevin McGuire, college football editor at thecomeback.com and contributor to Athlon Sports and College Football Talk on NBC Sports. And we've got Chad Scott, writer for gridironnow.com, and we welcome in Dan Hermsmeyer, the new head rifle coach at the University of Memphis. In this opening segment, we're going to go ahead and bring in Bruce Lloyd, attorney for Barney Farrar, to discuss what Ole Miss can do about their NCAA defense now that Hugh Freeze has resigned. And we're going to get him to go over some new responses from Rebel Rags and their lawsuit. Before we do that, though, you guys know what to do. Check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. We are on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow me, at ProSevereGary, that's P-R-O-S-E-V-E-R-E-G-A-R-Y. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, that's C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can download, subscribe to, and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, all your favorite podcast apps. We're on every one of them. Check it out. I'm telling you, we are there. You can also listen to us on Local X Radio. That's localxradio.com or on the Local X app every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Before we do anything else, today's show is being brought to you by Kyle Seeger's Designs. If you need great, affordable web design for your company, business, or just personally, check out kyleseegers.com. He can handle all of your web development needs, including site building, maintenance, branding, and more. For more information, visit Kyle Seeger's Designs at kyleseegers.com. Right now, let's go ahead and welcome in Houston-based attorney Bruce Lloyd, legal representative for ex-Ole Miss staffer Barney Farrar in his case with the NCAA. Bruce, thank you for coming back on with us. How was vacation? Thanks for <laughs> vacation. was too short. Um, and But I'm, I'm glad to be back in the office, glad to be at it and had a full day today in deposition, so I'm a little beat, but we're just looking forward to, look to talking to you guys. Absolutely. And we always enjoy having you on. You, uh, you, you tell it like it is with us, and we appreciate that. So, now obviously, we've had some big time stuff come down on Thursday night last week. Hugh Freeze resigned as head coach at Ole Miss due to a call with an escort service that uncovered more behaviors that the university deemed in violation of the moral turpitude clause in his contract. So, let's start it off slow. Does basically every university put a moral turpitude clause in their coaches' contracts, or was this something that Ole Miss put in specifically for Freeze, you know, based on his persona that he tried to establish since he got to the since he got the head job in Oxford. Gary, I, I doubt very seriously if that's a customized clause for Hugh Freeze. I, I don't know this, but uh, I'm going to assume that most contracts for uh, football coaches or public figures of any kind are going to have a moral turpitude clause uh, with their employer. That's smart on the employer's part. And uh, uh, so, no, I don't think that was something uh, devised specifically for Coach Freeze. Right. It, it's a it's a protection in case you get into any kind of a situation like this that is yeah, embarrassing. That, that's my understanding of the intent of it. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, I, I think it's, I mean, like you said, it's very smart. Um, and now, you are currently involved in Barney Farrar's defense against the NCAA, so maybe you can help us out with – with what's coming next for Ole Miss, even though you have nothing to do with the school's NCAA defense. At first off, just for Googles, at, did Barney know anything about Hughes' uh, problem, or, or did he know anything at all about it? Oh, I'm not going to comment on, on anything related <laughs> to what what um, what happened, Coach Freeze. That's uh, I'm just not even going to go go uh, into the to that. Um, totally understandable. I'll, I'll be, uh, so it, I wouldn't be a good journalist if I didn't ask, but I understand that you can't answer the question. <laughs> No, I, I, I could answer the question, but I choose not to answer the question uh, related to uh, the specifics of what's been alleged against Coach Freeze. That's a awful thing, and and, and uh, there's nothing I want to talk about, and there's nothing I want to talk about in, in, in terms of uh, Barney. And um, the, you know, so uh, we've Com- expressed, our, both of us, or I have expressed and expressed you know, Barney's feelings about Coach Freeze, and those remain, and nothing's changed uh, in that regard. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, now, Ole Miss has crafted all of their responses and defenses against the NCAA allegations on the basis that Hugh Freeze has exemplary character. Those responses have already been sent 
at the NCAA responses, from what I understand, uh, have come in. And Ole Miss should be receiving, uh, or at least they have, from what I get. It's already come in now. Uh, can they find a way to change their defense, or will they actually have to go into the hearing with the Committee on Infractions telling the NCAA of how great Freeze's character is after he was fired or resigned uh, due to moral turpitude? Gary, I doubt that the Committee on uh, Infraction panel pays that much of attention to praise and accolades heaped on a charge party in a response to a notice of allegations. They're pros. They're, 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 they're education people. Most, most of them are, I think. They're, they're, you know, as I, as I've understood in the past and that they're ADs, they're coaches, they're administrators and, and, and everybody who files a response to a notice of allegation heaps praise on the, uh, uh, the charge party. And what I what I believe that they will do, I don't. My, my short answer is I don't think it'll have one make one bit of difference. They the the, the pre July twentieth two thousand seventeen Hugh Freeze is the same guy to the NCAA uh, 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 panel on infractions that as the post July twentieth Hugh Freeze. I don't think it makes a whit of difference. That's my opinion. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Now let's let's jump off of that. Let's move from the NCAA defense. And one of our favorite topics on the show has been this Rebel Rags case. And sure. it, obviously, you have no dog in this hunt. And that's what makes it more interesting, because you can actually analyze this from, from being an outside party. Uh, sure. Terry Warren, Charles Merkel, Rebel Rags, they filed their response in opposition to defendant Kobe Jones's motion to dismiss, uh, his motion to sever, motion to transfer venue, all that. Let me read part of this article from omspirit.com before we get into it. It's a couple of paragraphs, so bear with me a little bit. Uh, sure. It says, in the some 389-page document, plaintiff Rebel Rags attempts to paint a picture of collusion among the NCAA, members of Mississippi State's athletics department, a national media member, and a reporter for an Ole Miss rival fan site. It is seeking to prove, through discovery and depositions, the NCAA, upon re- uh, the release of the first NOA, did one of two things— it either stopped an ongoing investigation in the middle of the process so it could inflict irreparable damage via leaks, etc., upon Ole Miss's 2016 recruiting class outside the confines of its own rules and bylaws, or the NCAA had indeed competed or completed its investigation but reopened the investigation 10 days later due to Mississippi State, as the source described, dropping Kobe Jones in their lap. In the filing, owner Terry Warren and Rebel Rags are establishing a joinder of defendants via conspiracy to provide false and defamatory statements about plaintiffs previously mentioned. Conspiracy being collusion to provide similar statements to the NCAA that were then leaked to Pat Forty of Yahoo Sports. <laughs> there's, there's so much here. Like, I could jump <laughs> yeah. into all this. Uh, Rebel Rags also establishes appropriateness of venue in opposition to Jones's attempts at changing the venue from Lafayette to Octobaha County. Jones asserts no connection to Miller and claims the suit is frivolous and retaliatory. However, Rebel Rags argues that through the discovery process, it can establish motive and cause for conspiracy to commit defamatory statements between Jones, Lewis, Miller, and John Doe's 1 through 15. Uh, for example, Mississippi State head coach Dan Mullen, Scout.com, Steve Robertson, and an unnamed NCAA employee. All exhibits attached provide a timeline and motive. Now, Rebel Rags and their attorneys have some big cojones here. Like, there seems to be some holes in the story. But that is a lot of confidence to go in and name the NCAA, Dan Mullen, Steve Robertson, Pat Forty, all these other guys in a conspiracy theory. It it seems like Rebel Rags is taking on all these guys to try and help out the school. Like, have you read through any of this, and do you have any opinion on, on what it could mean going forward? So could the NCAA take one of the boosters named well, in the NOA? I, I, like, to, could, could they take it personally? Well, I'll tell you. Let me let me answer that last question first. Well, does the NCAA take this kind of stuff personally? I, okay. I don't think so. If you that's that's just again, again, uh, if you get on uh, Gary and Chris, have you guys been on the Pacer system before? No, no. The, no. the public access uh, to court electronic records. And what uh, it is, okay. it's a database, and it's a federal database that has all bankruptcy filings, all appellate court filings, all civil case filings, all criminal case filings in federal court alone, just in federal court. And, and I pulled it up for the show, 
and I've got it in front of me, and I'm reading my pay on Pacer. I, I, I did a query for the uh, NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, and 358 federal cases popped up. And of those Good 358, grace. dozens of them are still open. Okay? That, now, mind you that there are uh, 50 states, uh, and all of them have colleges, and I'm sure many of them have had issues with the NCAA, so I can bet you there's probably a record if it were consolidated and you could access it, you would see that there are hundreds of other lawsuits that have been filed against the NCAA, and you will see many of them are open, and you will see the NCAA, I know, that I, my, my experience with them in, the, in, this, in this matter is if the NCAA uh, 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 doesn't blink, they just move forward and, and uh, with the task at hand. And um, so uh, do I think they'll take it personally? No. Uh, do I think that they will uh, that, that, that they'll capitulate and do what uh, private litigants are, are demanding or ask that they do? Doesn't seem like they will. Seems like they'll fight like heck. Um, and and uh, so uh, I will say this about the, the Rebel Rags lawsuit. It's, it's the word I would use as ambitious. Uh, but I, but I, I have to tell you that I, you know, I, I go. I, I want you to. I want to ask you guys. Do you yeah. remember uh, a guy named uh, Houston Nutt about uh, <laughs> 90, 120 days ago talking about filing a lawsuit? Do you remember that? Oh yes, oh yes. And do you remember that everyone had the opinion that Houston Nutt's threatened lawsuit would come to nothing? Do you remember that? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, and so my point is. Is yes, this lawsuit is ambitious. Uh, yes, it's a pick and a big fight. It appears to me, um, but uh, that's the whole nature of lawsuits: is uh, they can either uh, die on the vine, uh, they can uh, uh, get momentum and come crashing down a mountain like a huge snowball, running over everything in its way, or somewhere in between. Um, and as far as picking a fight and having big cojones. Uh, we've talked before about who Rebel Rags lawyer is. Oh yeah, so Charles. And by the here. way, just to interrupt you, I uh, I just started reading uh, the Fall of the House of Zeus. So oh, great! You'll, it's a fantastic book. It sure if you're is. From North Mississippi, if you're from Mississippi, yes, um, yes, it is. But but uh, and, you know, I, and I, when I read that book, I marveled. I mean, I, I said, man, this guy, this this lawyer, uh, and and his client or clients. I mean, he's going against the most popular, richest, uh, powerful attorney in, in maybe the United States of America. And uh, that didn't deter him. It, didn't, it doesn't appear. And so if you've got somebody that's going to that's gonna be ambitious and pursue a case of this sort, Rebel Rags has got that guy. Yeah. No, they, they definitely do. So and now going back, it, what, what could – could this – I don't know how to ask the question. Could it mean anything other than just for this lawsuit? Could could anything come out of this that would that would damage the school? You think? You know, I would be speculating. I, I uh, some have expressed the feeling or thought that uh, it'll it'll uh, um, antagonize the NCAA. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've expressed my feelings about that. I, I don't think a single lawsuit, uh, uh, unless you know it, it turned into something uh, like the Houston Nut lawsuit did, and you know, in and, and just a matter of, of days, became uh, just one other another lawsuit to, to now becoming a lawsuit for the ages. And that's rare, but when it does happen, it happens big, and it happened big in the Houston Nut case, and. Um, and I think I got off of what Gary, what you were asking, uh, but um, no, I think uh, I think you, you answered may, it. May, well. Maybe maybe it, maybe it will antagonize uh, the NCAA. I doubt that it will. I doubt that it will. will uh, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of influence it would have. But it seems to me the the uh, you know the parties to the lawsuit have obviously skin in the game. But I can't imagine it affecting uh, anything. Else, outside of whoever the, ultimately the are, and and at this point, and if you read what uh, uh, Gary, you just read that to me, it sounded to me like that there are some uh, parties that are being uh, talked about in these pleadings that aren't yet named parties, and I know that uh, the the Rebel Rags has a, a list of John Doe's 
uh, the implication being that, that those John Doe's are going to start getting plugged in. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. All right, well, Bryce, uh, Bruce, that's 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 going to wrap it up today, I think. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time to come in and help us break all this stuff down as often as you do. I Certainly. get the feeling that we're going to be talking to you more as we get closer to the COI hearing. So, okay, I look forward to it, guys. <laughs> that'll work. Have Y'all, a good week, hey, my you're friend. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. I really enjoy listening to your program. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank we you, appreciate sir. it. Thank we you, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. All right, welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. Right now we want to bring in Chad Scott, current writer and overseer of content at gridironnow.com. Chad's covered SEC football for over 20 years. He helped launch The Herd with Colin Cowherd while he was a producer at ESPN Radio. And you can follow Chad on Twitter, at Chad Scott. That's Chad with two Ds. Chad, thanks for coming on the show, and welcome to Winning Cures Everything. My pleasure. And when you summarize everything in 10 seconds, it uh, actually sounds like I've achieved a lot over the years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, trust me, you've been around uh, doing this a lot longer than we have. Uh, it doesn't make you old. It just means that you are well experienced, my friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, I asked you on because of the UAB article that you wrote. Yeah. and And then the Hugh Freeze news popped up on Thursday. So yeah. I still want to get to UAB along with some sure. other SEC topics and whatnot, but Let's start off with Ole Miss. We won't get into all the mess about the NCAA and Hugh Freeze mm-hmm. is firing and who could end up with a job. You got a short article up about how it's already affecting recruiting. How much did yeah. Hugh Freeze mean for recruiting at Ole Miss, and, and what's the ultimate toll for his uh, firing? Like, what what, well, what toll could that have on yeah. like the eight, 2018 class, but also on like transfers and future recruiting classes at Ole Miss? Mm-hmm. I think in the in the in the short term, he meant everything because all of those young men committed to him, okay, personally. And, you know, you, you talk to those guys, or, you know, I didn't talk to them personally, but you read interviews and uh, hear them speak, and they committed to Hugh Freeze and his culture and his way of doing things. So I would imagine uh, much of the old Miss recruiting class would dissolve for 2018 and have to be rebuilt. And doing so will be very difficult uh, for Matt Luke, who's now trying to be a head coach on the field, um, and on top of that, trying to keep a recruiting class together, put a recruiting class together, still this looming cloud of NCAA sanctions. And if you're a young man with a lot of options, really, uh, unless you've got some sort of personal connection or, or otherworldly tie to the place, why would you go to Ole Miss right now? And I say that as someone who respects Ole Miss, who has been to Ole Miss, who's like the old Miss, I carry no animus towards that program whatsoever. This is not just taking shots and, and dropping bombs on someone when they're down. But if everything else is equal, and it really doesn't matter whether you go to Ole Miss or Mississippi State or Tulane or Southern Miss or Memphis or Vanderbilt, why would you choose Ole Miss? And that's going to be a, a tough battle uh, for Matt Luke and that staff to fight. And, and, you know, as competitive as life is in the SEC, Boy, you can't just lose recruiting classes or, or have a recruiting class that's, you know, in the 50s or 60s nationally and expect two, three, four years down the road to be competing for anything. Well, I think that's why Ole Miss wanted to get this thing done just as quickly as possible. And on top of that, what an interesting thing you bring up there, you know, why would you go to Ole Miss? It, at other schools, like at Baylor, the entire coaching staff had been there for a while. And at Ole Miss, they just had turnover of five assistant coaches that were just brought in this past off season. They haven't yeah, had time point. to build those relationships, so it, there's yeah, there's yeah, nothing yeah. to bring them. No, you know another relation and another factor that makes this recruiting class probably next very very difficult. And, and quite frankly, the greatest punishment the NCAA will have handed Ole Miss is the length with which this investigation has drawn out because it took a toll a toll on. Um, this on the 2017 class it took a toll on the 2016 class it will take a toll on the 2018 class let alone what whatever the sanctions end up being with actual scholarship limitations miami experienced something very similar where they just couldn't get a decision from the ncaa and that cloud hung over two three four recruiting classes 
um, no matter how many scholarships or bowl bans or fines the NCAA uh, levies against Ole Miss, its greatest punishment to the Rebels has already been enacted with the, the, the pace uh, of this investigation, which is drug on now for many years. That's, great, I'm, great I'm sure. Point. Yeah, I'm sure they want this thing yeah. wrapped up. Could, as, couldn't agree more. At, now, I've, I'm going to let Chris ask a question here in a little bit, mm-hmm. but I, I am so interested about this UAB deal. Uh, moving off of the Ole Miss stuff, you've got a fantastic yeah. article up about UAB football's comeback this season. The article is titled 2017 UAB Blazers, The New America's Team. UAB mm-hmm. football program was shut down right after the 2014 season. It started yeah. a movement within Birmingham to get the football team back. Head coach Bill Clark, you know, former Jacksonville State coach, stayed on as coach even though he was offered other coaching opportunities. In June yeah. 2015, it was announced the football team would be coming back, and since then the school – seems to have really put the groundwork in to compete, not just to trot out a crap team. Mm-hmm. You had a yeah. chance to visit yeah. the, uh, the facilities at, before it's right. even unveiled to the team. How do they stack up? It, has UAB done enough to build fan support for a program that you know basically had none leading up to its demise back in 2014? Yeah, they're, they're making the most of a second opportunity, and that's, that's why I, I consider UAB the new America's team, um, because they have gone through such an American experience to – lose something that you only recognize how much you love once it's gone haven't we all done that with women or family members or jobs or something uh and then to make the most of a second opportunity Uh, again what a wonderful story that is the idea that they were essentially bullied out of their program by uh university of alabama tuscaloosa campus forces and were victims of uh, essentially a a screw job and to fight after something has been lost i just find it an incredible uh, american redemption success story in there uh infrastructure now is adequate with cusa you know it's not going to impress anyone in the sec but it doesn't have to and it's so far from where they came and i think there is uh, such a pride in that community and you guys being in Memphis maybe you ha- have recognized this at some point in, in the, the history of Memphis um, big picture you know city wide Birmingham as a city is finally going through something of a renaissance experiencing some civic pride that and I lived in Birmingham for several years in the early 2000s. I had family members live there for the better part of 10 years, so I know Birmingham well. And, you know, the way I, I used to describe Birmingham is, you know, welcome to Birmingham, or it's a balmy 1974 all year round. That <laughs> is a town that really never evolved much out of the civil rights movement. You know, it has struggled with race and local politics for so long it could never achieve anything everyone was pulling in a different direction well this uab situation came along when there was starting to finally be a groundswell of support and civic pride for the city of birmingham and i think this was another uh movement that the entire city whether you were a uab fan or not whether you went to auburn or tennessee or wherever else whether you'd ever been to a uab football game or not could latch onto and say hey this is our team This is Birmingham team, and no one in Tuscaloosa should be able to boss us around and determine our future. Did UAB have great fan support previously? No. Did UAB uh, generate a lot of revenue previously from the football program? No. But what fan base they did have and what revenue they did generate was not out of the ordinary with what the rest of CUSA does or really – Um, group of five football in general so to categorize UAB football prior to its uh, execution as just an unmitigated disaster and and failure on a national scale is not entirely accurate and to see them have this second chance make the most of this second chance and to have uh, if nothing else 85 paid college scholarships for young men that weren't there for the last two years what a great thing that is how will the trickle-down impact of that benefit that community for 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Oh, absolutely. It, it, you are correct. It is a lot like what Memphis has gone through. And it all it takes is the right coach. And I think that uh, I think that Clark is the right guy for that job. He, he brings a lot of excitement mm-hmm. because they were, I mean, they were just dreadful until he got there. And then yeah. he kind of got it turned yeah. around. Um, yeah, you did bring more. up something interesting. Uh, now, you, you brought up the scheme by the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. 
to get rid of the football program at UAB. It, yeah. If it yeah. is really a scheme by the Board of Trustees that oversees both the universities, how are they able to push forward with these new facilities and this, this whole rebirth of football at UAB? Well, essentially because the whole thing came to light. You know, because people finally uh, awoke to the truth and had enough. The, the, the plan to sabotage UAB football was so um, uh, devious People in the internet age and an age of social media where information isn't as closely guarded finally stood up and said, this is crap. Okay, and we're not going to let it happen anymore. We know what's happening here. We know who's orchestrating it. You're not going to do this stuff in, in uh, you know, closed-door meetings and smoke-filled rooms. It, it, let's bring it out into the open, and let's see if we can get by on our own merit, and let's stop uh, trying to uh, settle a personal grudge uh, by, you know, um, Paul Bryant Jr. that he's held against uh, the University of Alabama Birmingham campus and its athletic department for 30 years. So I think now that, that everything is out in the open and we know who all the, the players are and what their motivations are, uh, they won't be able to, to get away with it a second time because people are, are uh, woke so to speak, to, uh, <laughs> Twitter you know, terms. Love what, it. Uh, what has been going on there for so long. There you go. Um, talking about a little SEC stuff, and uh, this is something you wrote an article about I'm really interested in, not more of an SEC thing, Auburn radio thing. Um, I'm super interested in the tune-in channel that yeah. Auburn has. <laughs> I, I think this is fascinating. I've actually thought – for years now, I've been a tune-in guy, okay? I got into uh-huh. it last year for MLB, Major League Baseball. I'm a Boston guy, um, and I liked listening to their broadcasters call games. And I mean, I would watch games mm-hmm. on mute and listen to them on tune-in, or I would just yeah. you know drive around or cut grass or something and listen to it. So I, I love radio calling. I thought, man, the SEC network got its own TV channel. I wish they would get a radio channel that I could listen to and stream and this, that, and other. Now, Auburn did it as an individual school. Kind of groundbreaking mm-hmm. for me because I'm thinking, man, is there enough content to fill 365 days a year, 24 hours a day of one school's things? But then you start reading through what they're going to put on there, classic games and stuff like that. Man, I couldn't imagine being able to just mm-hmm. stream up all these old, great Bo Jackson you know, highlight reels uh, in, in games. Yeah from back in the day and, and listen to Pat Dye um, and, and not listen to Pat Dye, but listen to games coached by him and, and something that I think is innovative. My question, I guess, in all of that is, do you think that this is going to, you know, be a toe dipped in the water for tune in and eventually all the big schools in the power five world are going to, going to have this, or is this something that, you know, Auburn pushed for they got and, you know, might not bring a lot of attention to anybody else. Well, I, I can't imagine why others wouldn't follow Auburn and why there wouldn't be interest in Texas, Oklahoma, USC, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, TuneIn Channel, similarly. You know, that's one of the great things about digital is the overhead is so low. That's right. You know, it, it doesn't cost anything to add another TuneIn Channel. Okay, so we have 250, let's add 251. It's not like you're buying a radio station which costs $8 million or a television station. You've got all the hardware and all the equipment. Sure, you need some producers and you need some space, and you, but the overhead is so incredibly low that makes it easy to scale out. Uh, I would imagine that Auburn's probably a test case, and you know, within a, a couple of years you'll see any number of schools with similar platforms. And, you know, again, I think all of the, you know, the more and more that these universities take on their own Oh, how would you like media responsibility? So many of these universities now, especially in the SEC, have in-house reporters and That's journalists, right. quote unquote, that report <laughs> on the team as if they're working for a newspaper, and they get the scoops and they're at practice and, and do this sort of thing. So whether it's tune-in channels, YouTube channels, uh, you know, Snapchat feeds, uh, podcast networks, uh, satellite radio, uh, linear television. Uh, all of these programs are, are working on methods to um, distribute their content and, 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 and platforms on which to distribute their content because, you know, in, in today's day and age, my, my philosophy is sort of counter to what a lot of people say. The old adage in, in, in media used to be content is king. 
And that meant, well, if you're doing good work, whether it's radio, TV, written work, people will find it. Uh Uh-uh. I think platform is king today. I think the ability of people to easily find your work is the critical component to being successful. And that's through social media and it's through linear television, uh, satellite radio, cable TV, tune-in, podcast apps, on-demand, whatever it happens to be. There is so much content available, so much good content available. Whoever can put that content in front of the most eyeballs consistently with ease is going to win, whether the content is is absolutely the best or not. So the the content brings me up to kind of my next question about something like this. So is this more of a – so I know they're going to have podcasts available on there. So obviously Mm -hmm. anybody wants to talk Auburn sports is going to be able to be there or anything going on Auburn-wise. But – but, I don't know but, if anyone who wants to talk Auburn sports is going to be there, but I get, I get the point. Well, yeah, but you see what I'm saying. Like, that's that's going to be yeah. kind of what, obviously, what it's going to be a lot of. But what if you've uh-huh. got a show that, like our show, we cover the SEC, we cover all of college football, mm-hmm. we kind of cover everything. W- would, would those places have a home in these channels or not? And it's not just even sports, more along the lines of, like, college pop culture things, like, you know, Game of Thrones podcasts and stuff like that. There's a million of those out yeah. there. Is well, this a college thing about, or is this yeah. an Auburn sports thing? I think this would just be an, an Auburn sports thing, maybe an Auburn University thing. Would they put on a general um, sports talk show? I kind of doubt it. Um, again, because when you start doing talk shows, you start getting into overhead. Now you've got to pay people and you've got to get some sort of technical hookup you need a board op and you need all those sort of things you know if you look at what auburn is going to put on this tune in channel initially it's a lot of old games mm-hmm. which are already in the can so that's easy here yeah, that's, 2010 that's, that's auburn, yeah. uh alabama <laughs> boom you know for the next four hours we got you covered they'll do tiger talk which is their thursday night call-in radio show with the coach which they're already producing so that's a simulcast there's no expense there uh sure some podcasts with in-house people again those in-house sort of uh, reporter type folks that I've already talked about that they can um, put on tape and 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 then uh, send to tune in. Uh, absolutely, uh, they will have live play-by-play football, basketball, men's and women's baseball, softball, that kind of thing. But I don't think this is a play for a lot of original content. Um, this is sort of a a dumping ground for old play-by-play and then an, an, an outlet for on-demand content, which will probably also live on their website, social media, and, and any number of other places in addition to the TuneIn channel. Well, I love the play-by-play from the old games being on demand. That's that's yeah. the most amazing thing is being able to go back and pull up those. Bo Jackson was my hero as a, as a little, <laughs> little kid. My, I have a, a, a substantially older-than-me brother that went to Auburn during the Bo Jackson uh, days, and uh, and so I grew up um, – with with stories of him, uh, heroic stories, and so that's just one of those things where seeing that, being able to go there and pl- play those back is awesome. Absolutely. Let's yeah. let's jump off of that. Let's get into another article that you put up uh, regarding mm-hmm. Mark Richt. Now, you mm-hmm. brought up in the article how tired and out of it he seemed before his last season at Georgia, when most coaches, you know, seem to be rejuvenated, ready to get into a new season. He just seemed like the stress of the job was getting to be too much. It, First question, and I'll, I'll have two of these. Uh, mm-hmm. First, on Georgia, dating back to when they hired Kirby Smart, it doesn't seem like they even really went after anybody other than Smart. Are you of the opinion that they would not have been able to hire a big name because of the dreaded, you know, following a legend idea? No, God, no, Mark Rick was. I mean, Mark Rick was a great job. He wasn't a legend, okay? Yeah. Um, Jimbo Fisher has followed a much more legendary coach than uh, Mark Rick just fine. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't worry about that. I, I agree with you, and I think it was the wrong strategy. I think the, the the booster group and the movers and shakers at Georgia just became fixated on Kirby Smart probably uh, years ago before they ever had a job opening. And when that job did come open, instead of you know a real coaching a search and saying, "Hey, who's yeah. out? There? Yeah, let's have a real let's let's pie in the sky this thing. Hey, what is our wish list?" Um, they were fixated on, on Kirby and bringing back a former Georgia Bulldog off the, the, the Alabama staff, and there were a lot of good reasons to hire Kirby, um, but the, the reason that I was, not on, I was on board with 
letting go Mark Rick. I think he had, had run his course there. So I, I did like that decision, but I did not like the decision to replace him with Kirby Smart because that Georgia job is not one for a first-time coach. That is no longer a training wheels job. Mark Rick left behind a team that won 10 games and was really uh, a couple of tweaks away uh, from SEC championship and more comp- uh, level of, uh, of play. And Kirby Smart, because uh, of some game mismanagement and, and being new to the head coaching position, I think the Georgia program took steps back last year. Now, oh, yeah. will they eventually take those steps forward uh, under Kirby Smart? They might, but they might not. And, again, I, I think that's a job where, you know, again, it's it's a good enough job where you start calling people and making them tell you no. Uh, essentially what Alabama did with Nick Saban, what Ohio State did with Urban Meyer. I mean, this is a job where you really shouldn't, you know, limit your wish list in any way, shape, or form. And if someone tells you no, so be it. But, you know, one of my philosophies in life is I would always rather ask and say no then five years down the road, have someone say, you know, again, we'll go back to the analogy, you know, you're thinking about <laughs> asking someone on a date in high school and you go to the 10-year anniversary, well, why didn't you ever ask me out? Oh, God, I never thought you'd say yes. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, yeah. and that's sort of the, the theory that I, I you know, I, I, I put on Georgia. They just didn't open that thing up. And, you know, again, two years ago in college football is like a million, so I don't remember who were, who were some of the big names for that job, but Again, Georgia, most people will tell you that's a top 10 job in the country. And I don't think Kirby Smart is a top 10 coach in the country, uh, which tells me they uh, settled. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, moving off of that, over to Miami. Uh, Rick, does, he's always going to be able to get some talent at Miami. His division seems incredibly winnable every year, depending on whether or not yeah. Virginia Tech's pretty good. If he begins winning consistently there the same way he did at Georgia – can the stress of not winning a national championship build up on him there as well? Or is the van base just vastly different to the point that they won't set unrealistic expectations? Over time, it probably could. Uh, you know, again, if, if he's, um, you know, wins the division three, four, five years in a row, six years out of seven, something like that, can't get over the hump to, you know, either win the ACC or get into the college football playoff, I, I think – uh, eventually that could wear on the Miami people, um, just like it wore on the Georgia people. You know, again, but it was 10 years in the making at Georgia. You know, the, 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 the sort of pressure that came on Mark Richt was in dribs and drabs. Uh, but by the end of his tenure, it was the weight of an elephant on his shoulders. We are a long, long way from that happening uh, at <laughs> oh, yeah. Miami. And, and just in general, it's a much smaller fan base uh, and it's a much less pressurized situation. You're in a pro town. There's other distractions. It's not a, a state flagship university. Um, could that conceivably happen? Maybe. But we're many, many, many years from even thinking about something like that at Miami. All right. Well, to wind us down, uh, let's get it back to SEC talk. Um, who are your winners and losers for this season? What are your expectations coming out of the SEC? Yeah, well, obviously Alabama in the West. I think Alabama is still clearly uh, the best team in the league. I don't think that there's anyone close to second. I think if Auburn was in the East, I would probably predict them to win the East. But since they are not, I'm going to go with Florida. Uh, I am not sold on Kirby Smart like we talked about. I'm not sold on the Georgia Bulldogs. I think they find another way to lose to a less talented Florida team. I think there's some losing in that Georgia DNA. And from uh, being around Jim McElwain at SEC Media Days, he's kind of coy uh, about (laughs) his team, but I think he really likes it. I think if you had Jim McElwain in a private, unguarded moment, he'd tell you they're going to win the SEC East. I think he really likes his team. He loves his offensive line. He finally feels like this is a fast Florida team. Not crazy about what they have at quarterback, which is why I don't think they're a serious challenge to Alabama and, and why they may and will likely lose two or three games. But in, a, in an East that is still incredibly wobbly, um, I'll take Florida again. So I've gone out on a limb this year and picked South Carolina in the East because I really love the quarterback. And I am not sold on the offense for Florida just because McElwain hasn't shown anything of a good offense since he's been there. That is is that really that bold? 
I mean, how far from South Carolina is South Carolina away from Georgia? Because I'm not sold on Kirby Smart at all. Okay. And yeah, so, I think if you looked at the overall depth of talent and the ability to you know sustain injuries and, and move on, uh, no, that, yeah, I think South Carolina hurt. is still a ways from Georgia and Florida. And look. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you from Florida. I saw the, the Will Muschamp disaster up close uh, in Gainesville. So for you to, to to worry about what Jim McElwain's like as an offensive coach, uh, I'll, I'll hold the mirror up to you and say, as opposed to the offensive genius of Will Muschamp, uh, I'm not real worried about that. Well, not, I, I like I like quarterbacks is what I like, and I think mm-hmm. he I think he probably has the best in in the SEC. So. Ooh, best in the you know best in the I don't even know best in the East. You know that remains to be seen. There are so many. You know whether it's it's. Um, well, I don't know. If there's so many. Him okay, or Easton like, or I think Hurst it's him or Easton. Sidham, Fitzgerald. You know all those guys. There are you know there are a lot of good choices, um, and and time will tell who that that best quarterback in the SEC is. All right, you're more optimistic about it. I think it's him and Easton, and 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 especially in the East, and nobody else. So all right, well I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Well, Chad, we got to get out of here. Uh, everybody follow him on Twitter at Chad Scott. That's Chad with two D's. Uh, he is at gridironnow.com. Chad, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in and knocking this thing out with us. Thanks, man. My pleasure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Absolutely. This is Gary Seegers, your co host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at ProSevereGary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Tune in, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. We now bring in the host of the No Two Minute Warning podcast, a contributor to Athlon Sports and College Football Talk on NBC Sports, and the college football editor for thecomeback.com. You can follow him on Twitter at KevinOnCFB. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thanks for taking the time to uh, come on with us. It is my pleasure. Anytime I get a chance to talk some college football with some guys that know college football, I welcome the opportunity, so I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. I'm hoping to get you back on during the season, so let's uh, let's roll into a little uh, preseason talk. Now, we've been, we've been all over this Ole Miss story on our site and on the podcast, so let's jump into an article that you posted on Sunday over at College Football Talk. You said, uh, Derek Dooley among betting favorites to be next Ole Miss coach. The betting favorite at betonline.ag is Chad Morris at SMU at plus 300, and Dooley is the second favorite at plus 500. And you bring up uh, guys like Les Miles, Chip Kelly, Lane Kiffin. Now, you finish the article with place your bets wisely, but if you choose to place your money on Dooley, you might as well send me your money instead. I'm just (laughs) curious. Is it that far-fetched to think that Dooley could end up with a second chance somewhere and, and at Ole Miss, a school that could be facing significant rebuilding after, you know, firing an extremely successful head coach and some heavy NCAA sanctions, you know, I'm sure nobody expected Ed Orgeron would be the successor to Les Miles. It, is this as far fetched as uh, as we thought it might be? You know, it might not actually be. I was having a little fun with my closing line there, but I do <laughs> I do think that it might be a reach that Derek Dooley is going to be the guy that ends up going to Ole Miss. But I would say that. The chances of Derek Dooley returning to college football, I don't think are far-fetched. I just don't know if Ole Miss is going to be the location where a guy like him is going to bounce back into it. Maybe it is. I don't know. I, I could be completely wrong on this, and I've been wrong before, and if I am, I will readily admit it to the masses. <laughs> I have no problem doing that. <laughs> but uh, and, and I will say, nobody has sent me their money on a Derek Dooley bet just yet, so <laughs> I'll keep you posted. But, no, I think you know, I, I think Derek Dooley, obviously, his, his tenure at Tennessee – uh, was was pretty entertaining to watch from afar, but I, obviously there were some frustrations there. It just didn't work out for him in the long run. Yeah. But I don't think that we necessarily need to close the door on him returning to the college game as a college coach, as a head coach, I should say. Um, but I, I would not I would not rule that out as a possibility at some point in time. Where where do you think these numbers are coming from? 
I'm just curious, and, and obviously we've seen it all over the place with LSU last year and with Texas, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, there's always the betting favorite. Where in right. the world do these numbers end up coming from? I will, I will fully admit, I am not a gambling expert by any stretch of the imagination, but, I mean, we see some things. Every time a, a coaching vacancy hold, opens up, there are some names that are quick to be thrown out there, whether they're legitimate or not. They're just, you know, kind of, ideal names that you'd like to have included in a top five coaching candidates for this position and this job. And it's usually going to include some of the same names. And of course, with Les Miles and Chip Kelly being college football coaching free agents right now, it makes sense to put them in there. So you know that those names are going to be thrown out there. You look around the, the group of five schools, you look for guys that maybe have some ties to the region or are experiencing some upward trends where they currently are, uh, which I think you can suggest would be the case for Chad Morris at SMU. That's why those names always tend to fall right in line with these kind of uh, betting odds and top coaching candidates to replace uh, Hugh Freeze, uh, th- that kind of story. And we see that all the time, I think. Absolutely. Now, and my sources were telling me Les Miles was talking with Ole Miss before Freeze was even fired. And, and that's from people in Oxford and Baton Rouge. And I've, I've also been told a really off-the-ball name. Uh, do you know who Will Hall is? Name sounds familiar. He's the current offensive coordinator at Louisiana Lafayette. He was the former head coach okay. at West Alabama and former head coach at West Georgia. I don't see any way they lure somebody like Chip Kelly. I don't think Chad Morris jumps at it. There's also the idea of coaches that could be fired from their current jobs or, you know, that are at least on the hot seat, like Jim Moore at UCLA, Brian Kelly, Kevin Sumlin. Those three are interesting, but it, to me, like Charlie Strong is somebody that is really interesting. Because I know that Strong loses 15 senior starters after this season at South Florida. And if he's going to be rebuilding anyway, why not do it for $4 million a season in Oxford rather than $1 million a season? Like, if, if you had to put your money down today, who would be your best guess as to who's going to be Ole Miss's football coach in 2018? You know, I'll, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I'm going to say Matt Luke. I think he, you know, of all these names that are being thrown out there, people are kind of forgetting that they have an interim coach. And if it's going to be a, a, a process that needs some rebuilding, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of Luke maintaining that job on a full-term basis, at least for the next couple of years. Uh, because I don't know exactly where Ole Miss is going to look. Are they going to want to bring in a guy like Les, Les Miles or even Charlie Strong? I mean, maybe they will. They should probably make some phone calls about it. But you know, in the long run, and in, and in the end, once we find out exactly what the NCAA is going to do with Ole Miss, I think that could have some impact on where this program goes. So, you know, there's something to be said about maintaining some consistency within the program, but at the same time, going with a clean slate is not a whole uh, option that should be ruled out right now. That's you know, you actually led right into something that I was going to bring up. Hugh Freeze just hired in five on-field assistants this past off season. It, it is possible they could keep Luke and basically just tell him he's got to keep the assistants on staff that were just hired in. I don't know what the money situation is with, with how much it would take to pay off all those guys to leave after one season. Um, right. But I guess it depends on how bad the sanctions actually are, et cetera. Et cetera. I, right. I know they're in a lot of uh, legal battles right now, back and forth, but you know, I guess a lot of that could, uh, could come from that. So let's. Yeah, uh, I think I, I think the I think the important thing here is there's just so much that's really still unknown and it's still so fresh that you know no matter what names you throw out there right now, odds are if this hire doesn't come for another couple months, it could be somebody that we're not even talking about right now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's uh, let's move off of that. I, we are just all missed out. I think <laughs> there's so <laughs> much enough. going on. Fair enough. Uh, you said on Twitter yesterday that uh, South Florida is your top Group of Five team in the country. But on the comeback.com, you posted that you think Boise State will win the Mountain West and be the rep in the uh, New Year's Six Bowls. Now, I'm of the belief that Memphis is going to win the AAC this year and not South Florida. Okay. I, I'm curious, what do you think of Memphis, and, and why do you think that Boise would get in over somebody like South Florida or possibly Memphis? So there's a couple things that I put into my equation here when I'm talking about this. So like I said, I, I do believe that South Florida is probably going to be the best team out of the group of five this year. I just really like all the talent that they have coming back. And I think Charlie Strong is going to be in a good position to get them over that last little hurdle that they need to clear, at least for their own division. And then obviously we'll see what happens in a conference playoff or conference championship game. I think Memphis is right in that same category. I just give the slight edge to South Florida right now. But what I don't like about the situation for either South Florida or Memphis is the schedule. I don't know 
uh, you know, as far as conference play goes, as far as non-conference play goes, I don't know if either of those teams is going to be able to end the season with a win total that's going to impress that selection committee at the end of the year, uh, even if they give weight to the, the level of you know, competition within the conference. I think that's where Boise State kind of flies under the radar here. I mean, Boise State's still going to be a pretty good team, but if they have uh, some wins, I think they play, I want to say they play Washington State and maybe BYU this year. Yeah. You win those two games, that's not a bad ship to have if you're Boise State. And then if they can take care of business in conference play, including winning at San Diego State, I think that that ultimately gets them a slight edge at the end of the year, gotcha. at least as far as the selection committee. So it's it better wins. It, it makes a lot more sense there. That makes sense. Now, playing off that, do you think we are ever going to get to a point where the group of five could sneak two teams into the New Year's Six? So say Boise State and the ASN winner both go undefeated, uh, or even just with one loss, but against really good non-conference competition. Like, is that is that even a possibility, you think? I mean, it's a possibility, but it's not one that I think is going to be likely just because of the, the power struggle that there is with the way that this system's all played out. I mean, they, they have set aside one spot for the group of five, I think that they're probably going to try and do everything they can to keep it that way, uh, unless we're talking about a playoff expansion, which I think is down the line. But I think for right now, it's going to be really difficult, I think, to get a second uh, group of five team into that New Year's Six Bowl lineup. You know, As much as I would love to see it, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm against it, but <laughs> if you have two teams at the end of the year, uh, I think there could be some pushing and shoving uh, when it comes to the selection committee. Because I don't think the selection committee overall is going to value the work that's being done by this group of five programs compared to what they may have to evaluate from the power conferences. You know, if Notre Dame has a good year, that's another spot that could go away too. Absolutely. And so guys like BYU, Notre Dame, it's a, independence could play a big part of this as well uh, because they are, of course, grouped in, but not quite the same way that, you know, group of five winners would be. Um, and right, and it, it's, it's important to remember, BYU is not a part of the group of five. I mean, right. that's another program that's just sitting there. Exactly. And and you, you bring up, something interesting you know it's the the power struggle so a lot of this has to do with money you know it, right. a bowl game with memphis and you know at boise state say it say they were matched up against each other that's not going to bring in the same thing that you know even a three or four loss wisconsin and clemson would bring in it's just not the same um no yeah, exactly. exactly playing playing off of that to close this out i, I saw you tweet earlier about wisconsin and notre dame scheduling a two-game series but they're scheduling them at NFL stadiums. And now you're on my side. I, I feel like these kind of games should be home and home. I understand that there is a lot of money involved, but what do you feel it's going to take for good home and homes to become the norm again? I wish I knew <laughs> uh, because there have been more and more neutral site efforts being put together. And I, I get why they do it. They do it for the paycheck and it's you know, maybe it's easier to schedule you know, two teams that have, you know, with all, this, with all the scheduling that's done so far in advance these days, it's hard to get these games together. So if you have to uh, make, a, you know, make a couple of men's here and there just to get a neutral site game in an NFL stadium, I, I get why they do that. But I, I, would hate, I would hate to lose these home-and-home deals. I mean, I think Wisconsin and Notre Dame, they're going to play multiple games. And again, there's no, there's no confirmed information on what exactly they're scheduling. But if they do more than one game, I would love to see it in Camp Randall and in South Bend because those are just two great college football atmospheres that we should be uh, doing whatever we can to promote it even more rather than putting it in a watered-down, stale-down uh, NFL environment, at least as far as I'm concerned. But, no, of course, I'm a college football guy, so I'm always going to be biased that way anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. That is Kevin McGuire. Make sure and follow him on Twitter, at Kevin on CFB, and grab his podcast at no2menwarning.com. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to talking to you again during the season, buddy. It was my pleasure. Let's do it again. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more, check out Kyle Seegers Designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance, and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. We bring in now Dan Hermsmeyer, old Danny boy, the new head rifle coach at the University of Memphis. Dan, thanks for taking time to come on the show. Thanks for having me on, Gary. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. All right. Now, you graduated from Memphis in 2014, right? That's correct. Now, you became a grad assistant at West Virginia for two seasons, mm -hmm. both of which, uh, both seasons, 
the Mountaineers won the national championship. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been out of shooting for the last year. What made you want to come back and take over as head coach in Memphis? Well, I think that's a really good question, um, and it's one I've been getting a lot recently. Uh, I think one thing that really kind of pushed me towards this was being a part of this team for four years while I was here in school um, and really becoming invested in the program. It really helped me develop a love for the team, the university, and especially the city. I still have a lot of great friends here. Um, and just going through the process of the interview, um, the more and more I went through it, the more comfortable I became with the idea, and the more that um, the more the passion and love for the team in the city and the university kind of came back to me. Um, yeah, I've been in St. Louis for the past year uh, doing some accounting work. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of always stuck with me to think about what if one day I came back and kind of took over the program. Well, that, that's a common thing, I think, with shooters is that once you, you know, once you get to a certain age, you feel like, okay, now I can move on from this. Mm -hmm. And then you get started back into something else somebody calls you and asks you like hey can you help with this or whatever and my wife is the same way who you're friends with uh, anytime she gets asked to come back and do even summer camps or a camp you know back in february over a weekend she is immediately like i need to get my gun back out like i need <laughs> yeah. to get back in I, I gotta go to the the training facility yeah you know and it's I, I felt like that was kind of the same thing with you where i think that you would said all right you know what like i'm gonna move on and and do something different and then you get a call from memphis and it's oh you know what like i love memphis yeah like it, it's a it's an awesome city it's where you started your shooting well not started your shooting career but enhanced it mm -hmm. sure and so uh now former coach uh Woolbright was at memphis for 24 seasons he helped build the rifle program up to one of the top 10 programs in the country he did that with some I will call it pretty pitiful facilities. I could probably attest to that too. Yeah, That's, and I, I just because of what I've seen. Obviously, right. I'm not familiar with shooting nearly as much as you guys are, but from what I've seen of the new facilities, like these things look incredible. Like, how how much is that going to help the program going forward? Yeah, it is completely different from what the team was working with. Um, this new facility is currently um, right across the tracks from campus. Uh, it's in South Hall literally right across the street from the um, athletic office building. So, you know, the kids can get done with class, and instead of driving 10 or 15 minutes uh, to and from the range every day, which is what we used to do for however long the team has been going on, they can just walk right across the tracks, go to practice, um, you know, grab some food from the UC or whatever they want to do before or after, and um, head on back to the dorms or wherever they're living. And I think um, the the closeness of the range to the campus is going to be a big recruiting tool as well. Um, I know um, a few of the other NCAA rifle ranges uh, take a bit of walking or even a short drive to get to uh, from the main parts of campus. So I think this will be a, a real positive thing for the team coming into this new season and a big plus for recruiting too. Now, Ole Miss's range is – halfway across oxford isn't it mm -hmm. yeah that's it. it so that's a common thing right for for some of these programs because i guess because it is not a a money maker it's not a revenue stream uh it, so memphis will be one of very few in the country to actually have a range that is right there on campus yeah it is it is hard to, to find a rifle range that has a prime spot on campus just because like you said it doesn't always take precedence over other teams and you know other university buildings and stuff like that but yeah I, I think we will have one of the closest ranges to the center of campus in the NCAA so it'll be nice all right now let's move off of that let's talk about the 2016 Summer Olympics now I don't personally know any Olympians uh, I've heard that training is insane though mm -hmm. you came incredibly close to appearing in the Olympics last summer what is that training like like how intense are the athletes that are looking to get into the Olympics and I'm talking broad scale, like just the ones that are that are very dedicated to it. Mm, sure. Um, yeah, that was that was really a cool experience being able to train for a, such a huge goal like that. Um, it really came down to doing the little things the right way every day in practice, no matter if you were the only one in the range or if you know you were training with others. Um, it really came down to being disciplined and doing uh, the small things the right way. Um, and coming down the stretch through to the trials, you know, you were training, you know, probably four to five hours a day, five days a week, 
at least um, just trying to get in any last bit of preparation, whether it was actually shooting or strength and conditioning or mental preparation or any of that, um, just really not leaving any stone unturned uh, when it came to prepping for something like that. But yeah, it was it was an awesome experience being able to shoot with, uh, you know, all your friends, you know, because it is a really small community yeah. and everyone knows everyone. Um, and even though there were only a there were only two spots, I guess, per um, per discipline, um, you know, even even though it was so competitive, you know, everyone still, you know, you know, cracking jokes on the line, you know, out, out, outside of the, the match and stuff like that. And um, it's just it was really cool being part of um a trial like that with your closest friends and being able to compete with them. Now you said per discipline. Mm-hmm. Now discipline is it, it, obviously there's one sport, it's rifle, but sure. there's several different things, right? So yeah. there's what small bore and air rifle and etc. Yeah. Now there's only two, right? Is it small bore and air rifle? Yes. Or all right, now which were you trying to get into and what 4 to 5 hours of training a day just mm-hmm. on the same thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was I was training specifically for air rifle at that time. Uh, that was the one I came closest to. Um, but yeah, four to five hours a day of not just um, purely shooting rounds down range, but you know a combination of all those things. You know whether it's talking with your coach, talking with your peers, um, getting some ideas from other people. You know working with a um, a mental training professional, whether it be you know working with a strength and conditioning coach. Um, just all things like that, just throughout your day, um, just trying to do as much as you possibly can to be prepared. Now, now that weighs on you, right? It, now, it, for those that don't know, rifle is, it, it doesn't seem like it would be extremely taxing on the body, mm-hmm. but, I mean, I've seen the suits that you guys wear. I've seen how how straight and everything you have to, I mean, it is ridiculous to me yeah. how intense it is. And obviously, what you talked about with mental preparation it, I mean, there's a lot that goes into this. Yeah. So for something like that, I mean, how, how can you even begin to mentally prepare for standing and looking at a target for that long and, and having to stand in one position, right? So like Jess, my wife, had to have elbow surgery mm-hmm. because of shooting, because she had one motion that she was in for hours at a time. Like, how do you, how did you prepare for that? Like, get ready mentally to even begin training? Yeah, that's a real good question. Um, and yeah, a lot of people I know still in the sport and out of the sport have had um, similar type injuries like that, uh, mainly back injuries, because, you know, you're standing there with those suits on and you're, you're arching your back and relaxing your back backwards so that the weight of the rifle comes more over your center line. Um, so all that weight and pressure that's not absorbed by the by the suits we wear just rests on your back. And so, yeah, I know a lot of people that have had back problems. Um, but in terms of just preparing for that, it just comes down to um, making sure you do it every day so that your body becomes comfortable with it. And um, that's actually one of the things that we are going to uh, try to do new this year is to um, get the team in with a strength and conditioning coach over uh on campus and try to help them with that um with preparing for the long season and getting towards postseason and like you know really really excelling in the latter part of the season when they're tired and worn out and school's wearing on them so they can perform at their best at you know qualifiers ncaa championships and things like that how long is the season like when when is the the postseason how you know is this an all school year kind of thing our first match is going to be um, early October, and okay. it goes through until about mid-March is when championships are. So it lasts the better part of a school year. So it's, it's almost basketball season, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I, the, the rifle program finished ranked number 11 last year. I'm not going to ask for predictions. We don't want to get into that. What is your goal for the team this coming season? How do you want to build this program? Uh, that's another really good question. Um I think one of the first things that uh, we want to do is build a positive, cohesive team culture. Um, I think starting out with that base will really um, help the team come together, especially in the late part of the season when it comes down to performing at your best in high-pressure situations, um, leaning on each other for support. 
um, and then hopefully eventually qualifying for the NCAA championships to be able to perform there as a team. I think it's important early on to establish um, a strong team foundation um, and positive thinking, positive training, and things like that. But yeah, we have we have two really good freshmen coming in this year. I think they're going to add a lot to the program and uh, a lot of veterans coming back who have uh, been doing really well over the past few years. And I just think with some new changes over uh, the course of this first semester, trying to implement some new things, um, I think we're going to be looking for some uh, consistent success uh, throughout the season, and especially going into March. That sounds fantastic. All right, Dan, we can't wait to bring you back uh, back in again, explaining some more rifle uh, talk to us, because obviously I have no idea <laughs> about any of this. But uh, I'm excited to see what you bring to Memphis Rifle. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to bringing you back on. We appreciate you being with us. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Gary. I'll come back anytime. That was Dan Hermsmeyer, the new head rifle coach at the University of Memphis. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Herms USA to keep up with what's going on with my, uh, Memphis Rifle once the season starts in October. That's going to wrap up today's show. You guys know the business. Check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. You can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Every time we have a new story, every time a new podcast comes out, we post it there first. So check that out. Give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. It goes there as well. Twitter, uh, we are at winningcures, minus the everything. <laughs> you can also follow me on Twitter, at ProSevereGary, P-R-O-S-E-V-E-R-E-G-A-R-Y. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. If you have any stories or you just want to tell us how awesome we're doing, you can email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can also download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. And by review, I mean give us five stars. Help us out, especially on iTunes. That helps out a lot. It supports the show. Knock that thing out. But we're on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. My personal favorite is Podcast Addict, but I'm on an Android. If you're on iTunes or you have an iPhone, just do the podcast app. It's right there. Knock it out. We're on there. Uh, on top of that, you can also listen to us on Local X. That's localxradio.com or the Local X app every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Until Friday, you guys have a great week. This has been Winning Cures Everything. Later, guys. Hey, this is Gary Seegers, host of The Stage View. Make sure and tune in to Local X's first morning sports show, Winning Cures Everything, with myself and Chris Giannini every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Check out the site and grab the podcast at winningcureseverything.com.